Hey everyone, before we get into the video today, I want to tell you how I've been invited to join the incredible and awesome team of narrators over at Chilling. If you love horror and love listening to horror stories, then you're going to love what they have going on over at the Chilling app. Chilling is a new, groundbreaking platform that propels your listening experience beyond what YouTube can offer. Let me pull back the curtain on some of the features Chilling has to offer you. We've compiled over thousands of spine-tingling and nightmare-inducing stories, real accounts that will send shivers down your spine, and a broad range of eerie fiction categories. We've got something for anyone and everyone. It also grants you the power to handpick your favorite tales and create your own individualized playlist, something not even offered here on YouTube. One of my favorite facets of Chilling is the ambient sound menu. Seamlessly transition the background noise of your story without interrupting anything. Choose from a roaring, crackling campfire, to rain, or even just some spooky ambient music to accompany each and every story you listen to. You're in control. Chilling is constantly adding new and more stories weekly. They've already broadened their fear factor to include classic novels, vintage horror radio, and more audio series. Chilling is also ecstatic to announce the development of Chilling 2.0, enriching the platform with Chilling original movies and shows. Chilling is also now offering an ad-free experience with a modest subscription. This not only enables you to download content, but gives you the perk of early access to originals and exclusives. If you prefer listening for free, you can still enjoy Chilling, complemented by any ads. So it's holding you back. Find us in your app store by searching Chilling, or just simply click the link below that's in the description of this video, and you'll be taken directly over to Chilling where you can find me and so many other talented narrators. I'll meet you there, friends, with booze and booze. One last thing before we get into today's episode, I just want to give a quick warning that some of the stories you're about to hear allude to sexual assault, rape, and things like that. And I don't know, there's people out there that probably don't want to hear that or want this warning prior to listening. If you don't want to listen, no hard feelings. Just want to give you a quick heads up. All right, I'm done bugging you. Let's get into today's stories. When I was growing up, I would have this reoccurring nightmare that lasted about two years. In this dream, I'm wandering through this unfamiliar house, following a person I don't know. I don't recognize the features or the decor but I know being in this house with this person frightens me. I lose sight of the person and then my ability to swallow. Then there's hands behind me, corralling me down a flight of stairs. The door then shuts behind me. I'm alone in the dark and all I can hear beyond the door is grunting, moaning, and a struggle to get free. I didn't really think anything about this dream, but I did obviously recognize it as odd. No other dream struck me with such anxiety when I awoke. None of the other dreams that I had brought those same colors and smells, those riveting details that were almost cinematic in my mind's eye. One morning, I spoke to my brother about this dream. He got this weird, vacant look on his face. He then tells me he had a similar dream, one that would happen almost every single night. He told me the details. It matched mine almost perfectly. The eerie silence the creepy house, the strange man leading us through it. His dream ended in the same way mine did, being locked in a stairwell, waiting for someone to return. Obviously, we thought this was strange, so we went to our mom to help clarify what was going on. We thought maybe we were possessed, or the house was haunted, something. How else could we be sharing the same dreams? It had to be some inexplicable 80s cheesiness, her face dropped though, drained of all color when we relayed our dreams to her. She looked disappointed, depressed, but most of all, totally shocked at what we were saying. It all started to freak us out even more because whatever we were experiencing was apparently very real based off my mother's reaction. What our mother told us unlocked a series of totally insane memories that day, something that happened to both of us like five years before the dream started. We were kids when all this happened, so at the time of the actual event, I couldn't have been more than six years old, my brother just a little older. 
Mom said that we were playing with our cousin one day. It was a girl and older than both of us, but only by a couple of years. We had a neighbor back then who had some children, but they only came to visit him on the weekends. This guy had all kinds of cool outdoor play equipment for them, including a trampoline, which we were allowed to use whenever we wanted. The neighbor said it was a waste otherwise, since his kid only got to enjoy it on the weekends. Well, one day, the three of us were jumping on the trampoline alone. I don't remember anyone being home at the house, ours or the neighbors. We're just playing around when we hear this weird noise. We turn to find this older guy creeping out from between the backyard bushes of the neighbor's house. It was like he slunk over from the adjacent neighborhood, through the bush and then over the fences. At the time, the guy seemed elderly, but if memory serves correctly, he was probably only in his 40s or maybe 50s. He then approached us, asked if he could jump on the trampoline with us. He said something along the lines of, it sounded like we were having so much fun, he didn't want to miss out too. The three of us sank into silence. We knew better than to talk to this man. Still, there aren't any other adults around, so we don't really know how to tell him to go away without putting ourselves in further danger. So we all just turn and look at one another, waiting for one of us to speak up until this guy awkwardly crawls up onto the trampoline and starts to gently bounce with us. He never really stood up. He stayed crouched or on his knees the whole time, and he was insistent that he'd never been on a trampoline before. This resulted in him dramatically flailing back and forth. He would constantly fall right on top of our cousin. He'd almost kind of pin her to the trampoline, laughing and pretending that he couldn't get up. It was disarming to see him be so silly, but now we understand just how sick this guy actually was. He was basically molesting our cousin in broad daylight, right in the middle of our neighborhood. Then he asked if we wanted to go back to his house. He said he had something really cool to show us. Don't ask me why now, but we all agreed to follow him home. I think it had something to do with the silliness that we saw on the trampoline. This guy could hardly jump up and down, he probably couldn't hurt a fly. Whatever the reason, we climbed up off the trampoline one by one and followed this guy into the bushes, through to the neighbor's next yard, and from there, I don't really remember exactly where we went. Along one roadway and then another, till finally we're at his house. An old brick thing with shuttered windows and a chewed up doormat. He brings us inside and into the kitchen, where he offers us various snacks and drinks from the fridge. We were all thirsty from the trampoline, but no one is brave enough to accept. He insists that we drink some juice. He just squeezed it fresh that morning. Still, we all said no, and so he led us deeper into the house. It smelled a lot like foreign spices and cigarettes, that same musty smell from the dream. He explained that there was a fun game downstairs, and he wanted to teach us all. He opened this flimsy wooden door that led down to a long carpeted staircase. A single light bulb burned overhead, lightly swinging back and forth on a thin wire. My brother went down first. I followed. Then the door shut behind us. We both froze in place, now listening to the locks tumbling into place on the other side. I was too scared to turn around. I knew there was no one there, but I also didn't want to see this dingy surface of the door. I didn't want to actually see that I've been locked in the basement. I didn't totally understand the extent of the situation, but I knew it was bad, and I knew we were all in danger. That's when we noticed our cousin was not with us. He'd kept her in the main house after closing the basement door. We tried the door handle as quietly as we could, not wanting to alert our captor that we were trying to escape. It didn't budge. The pressure that we applied to the door also had no result. Without further options, we turned and descended into the shadowed basement. We could see the fuzzy glow of a television at the bottom of the landing. When we got there, we found an old bubble TV with a VHS player. There was a porno paused on the screen. It was a close-up of a naked woman lying on a table with a knife held against her neck. Against one wall is a row of five twin-sized beds, all neatly made, just inches from one another. There's also a small folding table covered in Chinese playing cards, 
all arranged in some weird order. It's probably the game the old man was talking about, but without any rules, we didn't know what we were looking at. I was told that we were down there for six hours. We could periodically hear the sexual assault of our cousin upstairs, hear her attempts to get free. My brother and I tried to pass the time as if nothing was wrong, totally detached from reality and the situation at hand. The police eventually arrived, knocked and then stormed the place, but I have no memory. My mom said they found us both in the basement, totally zoned out, just staring at the walls and ceiling. They recovered my cousin upstairs, who thankfully was still alive, but had been raped and assaulted for hours and hours on end. Each family had their own crazy trauma to deal with, and unfortunately, my cousin's family splintered apart not long after this. A very messy divorce took place. My aunt and uncle both moved away. I've never had any contact with that cousin still to this day. It's unbelievable how intact these memories stayed, even with me being so young when it happened. The old man got the book thrown at him, was awarded with a very long prison sentence, as he'd been an offender for most of his life. It's been 25 years. I still have anxiety issues, and those nightmares, they'll come and go. In my early 20s, I got hijacked in the middle of winter. I'm a guy, so it had to be purely criminal activity, not anything sexual, thankfully. Invisibility was next to zero. All I can do is coast and hope that nothing darts out in front of me, as I slide a good 10 to 15 feet before bringing my car to a stop. I'm in a 92 Geo, slowly drifting the streets in an attempt to get home. It's 3 a.m. I'm coming home from a friend's house, so it's a well-lit commercial area and neighborhood but still, there isn't a lot of traffic. I have the driver's window down to keep the windshield from fogging. My biggest fear is a car or person coming out in front of me before I can even see it. Just then, that fear materializes as a person steps out into the snow waving his arms like he's flagging me down for help. Fortunately, he was a good 75 feet down the lane, so I had ample time to bring my car to a stop rather than gamble and try to slide around him and create more trouble. Besides, the guy waving me down, there must be something wrong. I figured it was some kind of emergency. I roll my window down and wave, and the guy waves back. He's distracted by something on the other side of my car. I turn to find a second guy, creeping out from behind two parked cars. He has his hands in his pockets, his head down low. He's quickly approaching the passenger door. I don't know what to make of all this as it doesn't seem like any kind of crisis, so turn back to the guy who's standing in the road. I turn just in time to see him put a box cutter up against the side of my throat. I could feel the little point digging into the top of my Adam's apple. One good push would have done me in. He tells me to stay calm, everything's cool, I just need to unlock the doors. I comply, his buddy drops into the passenger seat and closes the door, then puts a second blade up to my neck. Then the first guy, the one who was in the street, pockets his knife and plops down in the back seat. They tell me to leave the neighborhood, so I start to loop back around to the main road. The guy in the passenger seat has his arms resting on my shoulder, with a knife edge dangling near my chest and neck. We'll just call him guy number one. The whole time he's talking about how he wants to carve me up, bleed me like a pig, all kinds of craziness. The guy in the back, who I'll call number two, is telling him to pipe down, keep it cool, everything has to go to plan. They give me this pretty vague street by street instructions to a destination that's maybe 45 minutes away. The whole time, I'm doing my best to keep my cool and stay quiet, which wasn't too hard. Both of these guys were trashed. They spoke to one another almost the entire drive, and this allowed me to discern some casual details and piece together the kind of night that these guys were having. Apparently, they met each other earlier that night at a bar. They went on to link up with a second group at this bar. We we're all going back to this big house party somewhere in my neighborhood. Everything was going great, but for whatever reason, these two guys got kicked out of the party. I suspect it had to do something with the knives and general criminal behavior, but I don't really know for sure. After getting kicked out of the party, their sole mission became securing a ride. 
The ride was with the intentions of getting across town to sell some shower curtains. They laughed a little bit every single time they said that. So I assumed it was code for something and I didn't want to know what that was. Eventually, they tell me to pull down the sketchy alley, park along the backside of the most rundown condos I've ever seen. Blankets and foil over every window, groups of shady individuals just milling around. I don't know why, I wasn't really that scared when I was giving these guys a ride, but it was uncomfortable obviously. But now being on the scene, I think it kicked in and I'm terrified. Clearly these guys are about to get involved with a drug deal. Drug deals can go bad, and I'm the one with the car. Guy 2 slides out of the passenger seat, then walks into one of the ground level units, while Guy is just chilling in the back seat, chatting me up. He asked me what I'm doing out so late, to which I was explaining that I came home from a friend's house. Guy 2 ends up coming back just a few minutes later, gets into the passenger seat, pulls a wad of cash from his pocket and divvies it up with guy number one. They both start giving me random directions, sneaking through neighborhoods until we come across this totally blacked out parking lot. Guy one says this is his stop, wants to be dropped off back at the lot. I pull up to the far end and guy one hops out and starts walking into the dark. Thankfully, guy two also hops out of the passenger seat and slams the door shut behind himself. The second door closes and guy one turns around and starts losing his mind yelling, pointing off in the other directions. You're not coming with me, dude. I don't know you. I don't know who you are. Get back in the car and walk the other way. Do not follow me. You don't fucking know me. That option has already sailed, though. I immediately locked the doors and rolled up the windows the moment Guy 2 got out. He looked back at me, and I'm already starting to inch the car forward. Even as we're making eye contact, he knows I'm leaving and there's no convincing me otherwise. Still, I don't know why, but I was pretty curious at this point. I pulled away really slowly. I heard these two guys just drunkenly argue about where to go, and don't follow me, and now what? That type of talk. I imagine this was exactly what I rolled up on back in my neighborhood, near that house party. These two idiots had somehow managed to secure a ride, get across town, and even come up on some money, and still fell right back into the square one situation. That was until it wasn't. Just as I inched out of the parking lot and back onto the road, I could see Guy 1 yank a little revolver from his waistband and jam it into Guy 2's face. I picked up the pace after I saw that, but even as I drove back towards my neck of the woods, I never heard a gunshot. I got home and locked my door, checked every window, and passed out like I never have before. When I was seven years old, I was waiting for my mom to come pick me up from school. This was before all the protocols were in place for a parent pickup. There's no checkout system of any kind. So when this dark, sleek car rolled up to the designated area, the smooth talking man said, Hello there. Your mom asked me to pick you up and take you over to the coffee shop near her work. I didn't think twice about it. Everything he said made sense to my little growing brain. I did the normal routine went up to the back passenger seat, flung it open, and then tossed my backpack and books into the seat, and then climbed in after them. He watched me click my seatbelt, gave me a nod, and we started rolling down the street. I asked him his name, but he didn't answer. He didn't even look at me in the rearview mirror, but I know he heard me. So I asked a second time, a little louder. Got the same reaction. His driving got a little more erratic the further we got from the school. It started out perfectly normal, full stops, metered acceleration, all that. Once we got a little distance behind us, he started driving like a madman. That's when I got scared, and I knew I'd made a mistake. I began to fidget nervously and cry. Everything just came down on me all at once. I didn't know this guy. No one knew where I was, and I didn't know where I was going. I couldn't help myself even if I tried. The panic slowly grew until I was inconsolable. The guy opened up the glove compartment and pulled out a comic book. Told me not to worry he'd have me home soon. He tried to act calm and cooled his driving off, but it was too late. I began to cry more because he was supposed to take me to my mom's coffee shop like he said. I remember at this point he started getting frustrated 
not paying attention to the road because he almost hit a woman on a crosswalk. He slammed on his brakes, and then the comic books went sliding out of my lap. Through blurry eyes, I unclipped my seatbelt so I could pick them back up. The guy yelled at me to get the fuck back in my seat and shut up. This was a complete 180 in his behavior, actually showing that he had a very large temper. I remember my knees buckling in fear, leaving me to pull myself back up in fear like an injured animal. His yelling scared me, so I started to cry again, breathless this time. I think I was starting to hyperventilate, but I didn't know that then. He starts to groan and sigh, rubbing his forehead and was sweating like crazy. For whatever reason, probably some childish need to placate people around you, I tried to just be good until we got to wherever it was that we were going. It didn't really make sense then, and I don't think it makes sense now, but I didn't want to upset the guy any more than I already had. I took one of the comics and thumbed through the pages while we drove. I'm not sure if it was my crying or the guy almost hitting the woman with his car, but after looking at some of the pictures in the books, I noticed that I was back in my school. I remember my breath catching in my throat at the sight, something familiar. All the man said was, get out, change of plans, leave those books. By this point, it had started to rain, so I walked back into the school. I went into the office and asked them to call my mother. I was shocked to see my mom in the office crying. There were a few cops, my principal, and my teacher. They were ghost white and a total nervous wreck. My mom picked me up and I started to cry harder. Then I proceeded to tell them what had just taken place, but they all seemed to have a loose idea of what went down already. One of the officers sprinted off to the parking lot to try to make contact with his unit. We were actively looking for this guy and his car. I guess my mom was just pulling up to the school when I got inside that stranger's car. She saw the whole thing, but the parking lot was jammed because of the school release. There was no way to catch up to him. She ran straight into the office to call the police while sending my uncle, who was in the car with her, to try and follow the man. My uncle took off on foot but wasn't fast enough. Like I said, the guy tried to make me drive nice and neat when we left the school, but after we got around the corner, he started hauling ass. I'm assuming that's because he saw my uncle sprinting after us and needed to lose him ASAP. I don't really know what the aftermath of that incident was. No one in my family really brought it up much after that, but we always made sure someone was there to get me from that day out. If there was ever a day when someone else was there other than my mom, I had to wait in the office until that person came to get me. They'd have to bring an ID too. Still to this day, I don't like to think about it. And I don't dare to think what would have actually happened to me had that man gone through with actually kidnapping me. Both my brother and I were in elementary school and my mom decided one day she wasn't going to give us back to our father. Our parents had divorced almost immediately after having us and split custody as well. So we go from house to house on weekends and holidays. Well, my parents were nutty, and they still are, and used us as pawns to piss one another off. Since we were kids, we honestly didn't know any better. We packed some of our things into a couple of small suitcases and a few black garbage bags. It was very spontaneous. One minute we're watching TV, and then the next, we had less than an hour to decide which of our possessions would be going with us. Everything else would be left behind forever, and that's how our mother explained it to us, and we're never coming back. Looking back now as an adult, what an absolutely crazy thing to say to a kid. What kind of situation was my mom in where she needed to abandon her rental and deposit overnight? Being young during all of this was a bit of a blessing, because it shielded us from knowing just how bad everything actually was. We were gone for about nine months, living in an awesome house with a spiral staircase and a central organ. Child services found us though, when my mother registered us for school. It blew a great gig, and it was the happiest we'd ever been. I have no idea how my mom even secured this place for us to live, if she owned it or even had the lease, but we were just young. I guess there's a possibility we we're squatting there. So my brother and I were pulled out of class on the very first day of school by police officers and then taken to a conference room with more officers, the school principal and school counselor. We were questioned about why we never contacted the police. 
which should have been obvious, were children. We had little idea, if any at all, as to what was really going on around us. It never occurred to us that our parents were just in a toxic, messy battle for custody. How could we know that we were on the run and technically missing? Mom gave us skateboards when we moved into the new place, so how bad could it actually be? We were resistant to cooperate because they were very clear that we wouldn't see our mom anymore and they were taking us back to Seattle. We didn't want to live with our dad. He didn't know how to cook. Also, prior to this, we had some pretty negative experiences with law enforcement. The only experience with cops we had was when they had to show up one night for a parent for another pickup. We associated them with a lot of bad memories. My brother snapped and started screaming, running around the room. One of the officers grabbed him, which transformed me into a very defensive big sister. I started kicking the officer, holding my brother, and I mean kicking the hell out of this guy. The ankles, the knee, the groin, full force, taking turns with each foot, absolutely lighting this guy up. My brother got hold of the officer's baton and hit the guy with it right in the chin. At this point, everyone had had enough of our shit, so my first grade brother was handcuffed and I was picked up by my ankles and carried outside. Up until that point, I was doing a great deal of kicking and punching though. This is where we got kidnapped for a second time. We were then manually transported through the school, right as classes were being released for lunch. I was wearing a blue cotton dress, and now at 30 years old, I vividly remember being hauled out through the school by my ankles. The embarrassment of knowing my underwear was showing. It still hits me today. We were put into the back of a police car, like criminals, and driven to child services in Seattle. We didn't stop for food or even bathroom breaks. My brother and I both pissed our clothes in the car. It was like we were prisoners and not children being taken back home. Who says no to a kid begging to use the bathroom? The shame I felt in the back of that squad car has stayed with me forever. We were so hungry when we got dropped off at the office building, but all they had was hot cocoa. I think we were both expecting something different upon our arrival. Something a little warmer, but it was just the same cold, sterile handling of the law enforcement. The kidnapping by our mother was nothing compared to the few hours that we spent with the police. We were never scared with our mom. Our needs were met and we were pretty happy, but the way that we were treated through the whole rescue was dehumanizing. The courts awarded my dad full custody in a restraining order between us and our mother until we were 18. My father was a very neglectful parent, as well as physically abusive. I can't even count the number of times that he was in court for child abuse. He used to brag about all they made him do was take an anger management course. How well he could bullshit his way through all of it. Real charmer, am I right? I was 13 years old when all of this went down. I was walking down the street with two of my friends, who we'll call Andrew and Anna. We were heading to a park in the neighborhood across from ours, separated by a busy four-lane street. Right after we cross the street, the speed-up suburban drives by and someone in the car yells out, Drugs or dick? We kind of looked at each other puzzled, shrugged it off, and just kept walking. Obviously, school isn't in session, so there's all kind of manner of hooligans around high schoolers or edgy middle schoolers, the whole nine yards. There isn't a car or sign of anyone else on the street that we're on now, so we just kind of head back towards the park. We figured it was just some older kids and decided to mess with us as they drove by. Not too long after that, the Suburban made another appearance right in front of us. Anna seemed to recognize one of the guys inside as being one of her neighbors. She seemed to be flirting with him as she casually strolled up to the car and began chatting. The guy in the passenger seat hung his arm out the window. Andrew and I just stood there, no clue on what's really going on. Anna took out a marker, draws a smiley face on the guy's arm, and suddenly, he flips his shit. As he gets out of the Suburban, he throws her into this nearby ditch, took the Sharpie and drew all over her, all over her face and arms and skin that was all exposed, screaming at her the entire time. Andrew and I are off-put to say the least. We have no idea how to react. 
as this guy is way older and way bigger than us. Anna laid there for a bit clearly bewildered. She didn't seem hurt or anything like that, but Andrew starts pacing around, getting a little manic and upset. His walking takes him furthest from the Suburban, and I'm still standing near the back corner of the car, and Anna just remains in the ditch. Andrew and I are still talking to Anna, asking to make sure she's okay, while still being totally unsure of what to expect from all these men. All of a sudden, the driver gets out, picks me up, slings me over his shoulders, and throws me into the back, through those double doors. I definitely didn't see that coming. Both guys get back in the Suburban and start driving off, and I'm pretty much frozen in shock. I look back and see Anna and Andrew, completely in shock as well, wondering if this is all a joke, or how much more serious it's going to get. We get further and further from one another without anyone reacting. They disappear down the lane and I find myself alone in the back of a beater suburban. I looked around me. The first thing that I saw would later find out was a potato launcher. I also saw a baseball bat, a rope, and lots of tools. There was only one seat in the back, behind the passenger seat in the main cab, and that's where I was sat. I was trying to pay attention to where we were going so I would know how to get back safely. It was easier said than done. These guys were driving beyond crazy. I don't think the driver ever even used the brakes, but just coasted, jerked the wheel, and spun around every corner. I started to get sick from the back and forth motion, so paying attention to every little turn was very difficult. Meanwhile, these guys are talking to one another like I'm not even there, asking each other where a good spot to assault somebody is, and other colorful exchanges. At some point, they offer me a drink of something, it's in a water bottle and the liquid is slightly opaque. I assume it's some sort of drug. And in my state of super adrenaline, I stupidly say yes. I watch as the passenger pours me a little sip in the bottle cap, then carefully passes it to me. I take it, pretend to down it, and throw it out the window beside me. I have no idea what I was thinking when I said yes. I obviously could have said no and I just avoided the whole thing. It was risky getting handed a drug than having to toss it out right behind the guy that gave it to me. I knew I could handle getting beaten up, maybe even sexually assaulted, but if I got drugged, it was over. Unfortunately for me, they didn't notice me pour it out. Fast forward a little bit, and they pull into the secluded park, the kind of park you might drive by a million times and not even know it was there. The view of the park was shielded from the main road by a huge line of very dense trees. This was my first time ever being here, but these guys seem to be right at home. I notice one car in the parking lot as they're pulling in. It's a family with two small children, packing up and getting ready to leave. The two guys kept going past the parking lot and then pulled to the very end of this park, going from the asphalt into the grass as they went. They stop and get out and are totally ignoring me at this point, or at the very least, acting like I'm insignificant and a non-threat to them. It just feels like cool guy energy, trying to show off to a 13-year-old about how much they can get away with. They're sharing a cigarette and just talking about whatever in front of the Suburban. I'm still in the seat behind the passenger main seat, and I notice the door is locked, but the window is down. I think for a split second, then jump out of my window and run like the wind towards that family that I'd seen in the park earlier. It takes me 10 or 20 steps before I realize I'm breathless, screaming at the top of my lungs. I have no clue where I am or if that family is even still there and the shock is now starting to wear off. I make it to them just in time, screaming and yelling for them to wait for me. Thankfully, they hop out and dial 911. Those two guys got in the Suburban to chase after me, of course, but I managed to dodge them by zigzagging along. They leave the park once they see me talking to that family. The cops eventually come out there, and for some crazy reason, the two guys in the Suburban come back to the park not long after. And I guess they couldn't see the cops from the road because of those trees. But once they got close to us again and they saw the police, the police see them. So thankfully they got caught. From my understanding, they were in jail for two weeks and only got two years probation. One day I'm walking back to my house long after this incident and checking my mail. And what do I see but none other than that damn suburban. It turns out that one of those guys had moved in just two houses down from me. I said hell no, got my family to file a restraining order that week. Occasionally I would still see the Suburban around town from time to time and yes, it definitely terrified me. Thankfully nothing really else happened to me 
and I never saw those men again. But I was told from Anna later on that one of those guys had died from an overdose, and I can't say that I was sad at all. I haven't really relived that experience in my mind in many, many years, and it's crazy how thinking back to it now, my adrenaline starts to flow just thinking about it all. Growing up, I wasn't really a big drinker. In fact, by the time I turned 21, I'd never had a taste of alcohol. My friends were definitely a little more into the party scene than me. So a couple of months after my 21st birthday, they convinced me to go out clubbing with them. I'd been to house parties and I loved to dance, so it wasn't hard to get me to go. My boyfriend was going to drive us, so the whole scene thing like a no-brainer. Fun, safe, responsible. We have a drink and I'm feeling good. My friends decide to order us a second round. Between the dancing, loud music, and newly added alcohol in my system, I started to feel a little fuzzy. I remember my boyfriend getting me a bottle of water, then boom, nothing. No sensory awareness, no memory. I blacked out, and then awoke lying in the back of a random car, with two foreign guys in the front. I start freaking out and crying. I asked where my friends were, where I was. I want to be taken back. I had no idea how much time had actually gone by. Was it even the same night? I was babbling at these men. Total incoherent panic. They lied to me and said my friends had ditched me at the club. That they didn't care about me anymore. And they decided to take care of me instead. They rubbed my legs, which I could hardly move. And laid it on thick. Sweet, charming, promising me the world. It was scary in an instinctual way. These guys didn't even know me, so none of this was ever going to feel right. Then I blacked out again. When I came to, I was still in the car, not even knowing how long I'd been out. I realized they'd stopped the car and some other people were coming in. Three girls. I clambered out of the stopped car and threw up, and the girls surrounded me. This was going to be my chance to bolt, to maybe be seen by somebody actually normal. Full force vomiting was not part of my plan, so I stopped much sooner than I wanted to. These girls rubbed my back and made these pitiful sounds, like I was a stray animal or something. I begged them to let me go back home, to take me to my friends. But all they said was that the guys would take care of me. They pushed me back into the car and I blacked out again. The third time I came to, I was being led into a house. The girls splintered off and went into some other rooms, while the driver led me through the kitchen and down into the basement. I really gained some awareness when I saw the dark steps before me. If I went down there, I was never coming back out. I clung to the doorframe and screamed, sobbed for anyone to help me, that I didn't want to be hurt. No one came though. He pried my hands free and forced me down those stairs. I surrendered to my fate and descended into darkness. When we got to the landing, he pulled the bedding off of a bed and spread it out on the floor. He explained that this is where his friend stayed and he wouldn't like me on his bed. He went and got some more blankets from another room and laid those down too, creating a little bed for us on the floor. I was crying so hard I felt like I was going to throw up, beyond confused, asking to go home over and over again. He ignored me though, the guy never said a word. The panic smothered me and I blacked out again, I think this time just from sheer exhaustion. I woke up the last time and he was yanking my clothes off and I went right back into screaming, biting his hands and his arms away from me, continuing to beg to go home, to which he agreed, but only if I gave in and had sex with him. He said he didn't have sex with sleeping girls, that I needed to work at it. Needless to say, the rest of the night went on in the same manner. He pulled me to the floor and held me there, demanding that I please him as I continued to cry, which finally got underneath his skin. He got pissed off and said I owed him for everything he was doing for me, and that I was ruining his mood. He told me again that the only way I was getting out of this is if I did what he wanted. The anger made him get more physical, slapping me, choking off my words. Now, it was him saying the same thing over and over again. The same demand, clear as day. 
At one point, I had to use the bathroom, so I pleaded for that. And thankfully, he gave in, at least. He let me go. We got up, and he led me to the bathroom on the other side of the basement, wherein he turned the light on and leaned up against the open door. He told me to go while he waited right there. It was humiliating and scary at the same time. And when I started to take too long, he chastised me, telling me that I wasted his entire night for nothing. Now he was too tired to do anything, and I'd have to wait to go home till later. I got myself together just before he dragged me back to the bedroom, forced me back onto the floor, and held me there until I passed out. I was terrified. I thought I'd never see my friends or family again. I'd die at 21, scared and in the presence of a stranger. I kept thinking, is this really what happens when you drink? Because damn, all of this was crazy. My head was swimming from the panic and the drug that I must have taken at the club. I barely moved for fear of stirring this guy awake or getting his attention in any way. In the morning, he told me it was going to be a long drive back because he'd taken me out of state. I started to ask what he was talking about, but he just threw my clothes in my face, told me to get dressed. He told me I better start walking without any keys, cash, or phone, and that I'll probably need to ask for directions. I started to sink back into that panic now. How far away from home was I? He must have seen the disbelief on my face because he started to laugh at me then. He snatched me up and led me back upstairs, pushed me into a passenger seat. It turns out we weren't across state lines. We hadn't even left the city. He gave me the most awkward ride of my life back to my neighborhood, where I just randomly had him drop me off to avoid knowing where I actually lived. It turned out that my friends and my boyfriend, everyone, had been looking for me all night. One of the drinks I had must have been spiked because after that second round, I completely disappeared. They turned the place upside down for the next few hours until it closed, trying to find where I went. It turned out that those foreign guys had stolen me away from my friends and then eventually left the club. I thank God that it didn't get any worse than it already did. I have a kidnapping story of my own, but it's not what you would expect, so just bear with me here. When I was about 11 and my brother was 9, we had a small period of time where we had some contact with my father. Eventually, my mom gave him some visitation, hoping he wasn't the same monster she knew him to be, since he was supposed to be sober. Big mistake. We were living in Vegas at the time. He was taking us to Palmdale for a few days to go see our dying grandmother. My mother allowed it, but she had a really bad feeling about it all. Still, it was our grandmother. My mom felt bad about not letting us say our last goodbyes. So off we went. We were going to go stay with some family for a few days with my uncle. After that, we weren't really sure. My father had made a lot of threats throughout our lives, saying he would kidnap us, spite our mother, and then take us to Mexico. Everyone thought he was full of it, but apparently, he finally decided to make good on those threats. This was to be the first stop, and thankfully, that's where things started to unravel. My father was never really involved in our lives. He would never had us longer than one night. He didn't know the nightmare that my brother and I were, and he was about to find out. First things first when we get there, we're hungry. My brother and I are notoriously picky eaters. We'd literally starve ourselves before eating something that wasn't in our list of acceptable food. These people didn't know us though, so they were completely unprepared to feed us. After several tries and consistent refusal, they just took us to in and out the rest of the days were a nightmare to get us to continue to eat. We preferred to just watch people eat. And after a couple of days, we weren't allowed back to the dinner table during meals. It wasn't until a couple of weeks go by when my friend told me he found it really creepy that I was watching him eat and that I finally figured out why we were banned from the dinner table during meals. The next issue was my energy level. I was a very hyperactive kid. I never stopped moving, ever. I ran around all over the place, usually screaming, and this started to affect my asthma, which is exercise induced. We had forgotten my inhaler, so it was no longer in control. They couldn't stop me from running around though. The less I moved, the louder I got. If only they knew my mother's secret to keep me still and quiet was books. 
So started the need for me to be watched 24 seven to make sure that I accidentally didn't kill myself or something. My brother was the exact opposite. He was quiet, calm, and completely cold. It was impossible to get close to him. The only time he would come out of his shell was when I would grab him to run around screaming with me. Great. Now he had two children literally screaming all over the house. Eventually they took us to the mall since it was too hot to go out to the park for some peace and quiet. Too bad we didn't constantly wander off. Too bad we constantly wander off and I don't know how many times they lost us but it was enough to drive them mad and then take us back to the house. The next issue was our insomnia. My brother and I are not good sleepers in the best of situations and this caused us to basically not sleep at all. We would stay up all damn night talking. I would talk very little or even go completely mute with strangers, but I communicated with hand movements and random noises. The only people I felt safe with here were a couple of cousins and my brother, and when I talk, I talk. It's impossible to get me to shut up, unless you put on a TV, a video game, or a book in front of me, so yeah, we talked all night. I bet you're wondering why they didn't drug us with like some NyQuil or something, but I'm allergic to NyQuil. They couldn't just drug my brother either. That would leave me alone and destructive. The next issue is that my brother and I were dangerously curious children. We'd get into anything and everything just to see if we could learn something new. We'd go into closets, into cabinets, the oven, sheds, fish tanks, electrical sockets. My mom had still had the house partially baby proof because of this compulsion. 13 years later, the house is still partially baby proof because of all this. As you may have noticed by now, my father hasn't been mentioned much up until this point. Just random aunts and uncles. And that's because the son of a bitch ran off after the first day. I guess he remembered how bizarre my brother and I were. That or my fighting with him. I don't know why, but I never got along with him. And my mom tells me stories about even as a baby, I would find ways to fight him. I'd kick, punch, and scream over everything. And this time was no different. So, he went to where my grandma was staying. And I didn't actually see her until the last day. It was also the first time in days that I saw my father. And the first time we were allowed to call our mother. After that, my father took us straight home. It was weeks before we heard from him again. And that was when my mother decided we were no longer allowed to sleep over at his house. A few months after all of this, my grandmother died. He relapsed with meth. And we never saw him again. It took over 10 years before I was told what exactly happened. I'm still not sure if my brother knows. It really never gets brought up. Regardless, I'll always remember those days as being really boring. Seriously, how hard is it to provide two kids with a couple of books? Hey everyone, thanks for listening if you stuck around to this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Twitter, you can stalk me on Facebook, and you can also stalk me on Instagram. All these links are below. Well, howdy, y'all. What's going on? Um, hopefully you enjoy this episode. Hopefully you like the Alaska stories. I really had fun with that one. Um... I can't remember. Let me look really quackly. Um, urban ex oh my god, urban exploration or delivery driver stories are probably going to be next. I'm not sure which one I'm going to do. Probably urban exploration. Haven't done one of those in a while, so that'll be uh, Thursday or Friday. Not sure which one. It'll depend on you know when I get time to record or whatever. Um, also, uh, what else was I going to say? I don't remember. Um, yeah, so look out for that on Thursday or Friday, um, and, uh, yeah, again, lost my train of thought, so, uh, I think I'm just gonna end it there, because I'm not gonna keep you any longer, um, hope you, again, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I'll see each and every one of you, oh, wait, um, I, I think I put up in the community chat, but this is blatantly obvious at this point, uh, if you see somebody in the comment section, saying you've won blah 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 i think anybody in the right mind knows that it's bullshit and it's a scam and uh whatever but uh i also know a lot of gullible people not saying that's you but please don't respond to that uh, and if you can report it um because it's not me um 
So yeah, I feel like I've made it in a sense because I have uh, people trying to scam in the comment section. So that feels as shitty as that sounds. Uh, it feels good in a weird way. So uh, yeah, obvious, but there might be people that need to hear that. So if that's you, don't comment back to it. Don't hit it up. Don't email. Don't what, do whatever they're asking you to do. And uh, again, I'll see you on Thursday or Friday for the next episode. I love you all. Thank you for the support. It means the world to me. I'll see you then. Cheers.